that we might do tonight to open is read a private text message exchange, <laughs> 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 which uh, occurred last night, actually, because I have got a little bit of a leave pass to be away um, from my four-year-old and my two-year-old in Sydney, and I'm very excited about that. <laughs> I was particularly excited that I could go and eat at a place in Melbourne that for some inexplicable reason I like. It's in Burke Street Mall. It's called the Spaghetti Tree. <laughs> do, do any of you know do any of you know it? I think Is that it? non-polite laughter <laughs> signifies that <laughs> that might not be an incredibly cool place. Is it is it ironic cool? <laughs> oh. The shame is just pulsing <laughs> off that audience. So I've texted Crab a photo of the uh, aforementioned spaghetti tree. I'm while this exchange is happening. I am uh, at my kitchen table at home trying to finish a <laughs> book that I have due on Monday. Oh God, we're already just, at the Melbourne. I know. Terminal sorry, <laughs> just all the time crying. So that's what I'm doing um, while this is happening. So <clears throat> I've texted the photo, and I've we'll just do it like a conversation. The benefit of eating here alone <laughs> at 5.30pm is that I just spotted the accordion player walk in with his case, but I'll be gone before he starts. Saw that Lee Sales eating alone in a spaghetti house. Sad, really. She's quite attractive for a gangly blood nut. <laughs> it's like crazy ex-girlfriend, except I'm crazy young pensioner. Eats at 5.30, so can be back in hotel room by 6.15 to watch my stories. <laughs> also, how do you know I'm not picking up at Spaghetti Tree? Oh, the painful glamour of your life. Also, I'm as certain that you are not picking up at the Spaghetti Tree as I ex instinctively was that you were not smoking behind the bike sheds as once accused by your high school principal. <laughs> Oh, bloody hell, as if I didn't appear crazy enough. Now I've started that hysterical laughter that we do while entirely alone. <laughs> Seriously, we need to write a sitcom. This is sitcom-like. She looked like she was laugh crying. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Maybe she just feels alone. I feel guilty about not saying anything. I hope she's okay. The premise of our sitcom will be that we are neighbours. Here are our houses. And I've texted Crab a photo of a lovely quaint cottage and next door is a postmodernist monstrosity. You're very funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how you meant it to be read. I thought you... <laughs> oh. I read it like, you're very funny. <laughs> I really was quite taken with that animal show that you played for me yesterday. More about that later. Those producers must have been smoking some amazing... Is it too late to demand the relevant AV equipment from the Wheeler Centre? Imagine if we just played that... and said nothing. It would be quite avant-garde. <laughs> Though, Four Corners would immediately have to run a full documentary with that lady from Animal Liberation. Oh, massively. It's like that performance art woman who just sits in galleries and makes unbroken eye contact with people without speaking. Did you see that clip when her ex-husband came in, who she'd not seen for years? The emotions across their faces were absolutely amazing. Is that Marina Abramovich you're talking about? Remember, I have a four-minute short-term memory right now and can only just remember who you are. Yep, that's her. What if the whole show tomorrow night was us playing seven minutes of that show you played me, then us creeping on stage with you dressed as a cat burglar and me as Ronald McDonald, letting out a gigantic scream each, and then the entire stage plunges into black and up comes a one-word slide, moist. <laughs> and after 30 seconds, a question mark fades up so it's moist. <laughs> Beep! Oh, now I've wasted so much time on my concept art that the accordion players just started up with something from Les Mis. Beep! I think it would be nice if after the moist thing appears, then the theatre is gently flooded with amniotic fluid. <laughs> Possibly human, but I'm open to possibilities. Ha, 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 ha. We should actually just read out this exchange and then piss off for dinner. Done and done. <laughs> Did that work out, do you think? <laughs> 
I think that would have been a very exciting show. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the amniotic fluid may yet flow. So what we thought we would do tonight is have a bit of a talk about the culture of our childhoods uh, because that obviously informs to a degree who we are today. Uh, so that's the plan. <laughs> Sadly, it's just going to be me on my own because Crab can't speak <laughs> because she has a mouthful, <laughs> which was all part of my cunning plan when so I asked I'm for baked I'm just goods. making an educated guess that the culture of your childhood will last long enough for me to eat half a bun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'll save mine for when you, when you jump into it. So look, let's start with books as we always do because I want to tell a story about, which I might have actually told on the podcast before, so sorry about that, but... Um, Somebody once in a bookshop in Brisbane found a copy of one of my Nancy Drews from when I was a child that's got my name written in the front of it in green pen. Uh, and let the record show that the dot on the I is a circle. <laughs> and the dangly bit of the G is like swirled around into many little things. And she found it in a bookshop in Brisbane. In fact, there's a bookmark from the bookshop, Archives Fine Books, and she posted it to me at the ABC. I thought that was absolutely mm. fantastic because I was a very big Nancy Drew fan. Not a big enough fan to have not turfed it at some point, obviously. <laughs> but, um, yeah, she sent it to me. One of the reasons I liked Nancy Drew was because nothing fun or mysterious ever how fun stuff happened no, nothing mysterious ever happened in our neighborhood mm. and i was always looking for something so i was having a quick fl flick through this yesterday and it said bess remarked that there were dogs on the place but no one had heard them barking so many mysterious things have happened she added in two days a strange cloud an abandoned plane and now a stolen palomino <laughs> stuff that never happened in bald hills <laughs> Every Palomino remained unstolen in your neighbourhood. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a Palomino so bad. I knew someone with a Palomino. You had one? Um, no, I oh. knew someone with one. You used um, one? I, I knew a oh, person who had a Palomino. <laughs> oh, sorry. A Palomino right. is a kind of like ridiculously sort of honey-coloured horse with a kind of a blonde mane. It's basically your sort of under the age of 10 pony fancy in girls dream yeah effectively. barbie had one yeah and yeah i really really wanted one i actually grew up on a horse farm so i um my kind of romantic view of horses was really whacked out of me at an early age given how much horse poo i had to pick up so ah, right. it's amazing how de-romanticizing that can be <laughs> did you read nancy drew I wasn't mad for Nancy Drew. I think I might have read a couple. My nine-year-old daughter's quite into Nancy Drew these days. Um, I remember being a bit of a Trixie Belden fan. Mm -hmm. I, I read quite a bit of Trixie. I was very um, dictated to by my school library in my country town. Like I was, that was my, my reading patterns were very much set by what was on the shelves. That's a delicious cinnamon bun. It's really that? good, yeah. It's really gooey and yum. Um, but we also, also used to have this kind of book ordering service. It was like a mobile, you could, it was like a, postal delivery thing like you could it was like you'd borrow books through the post because mm -hmm. we were so remote mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was quite exciting library books kind of um arriving in parcels we used to have some book club thing where um you filled in a piece of paper like it was like a little catalogue that came mm. around you filled in a piece of paper and then they delivered them and i remember the excitement of when the it was like a sort of washing basket would come with the books oh, in it. oh yeah so what was your favorite childhood book um, well, I loved, I liked The Wind in the Willows, um, mm -hmm. the books that I remember my mum um, reading out to us, I remember, you know, with a lot of fondness. Um, all of my kind of kid books that I loved were all kind of animal related, really. I used to listen to this um, uh, album called um, Captain Beaky's Greatest Hits, and it was like, I know, it was like this... Um, it was all these sort of Royal Shakespeare Company actors singing funny songs about animals. They were really, really funny and um, kind of people like Harry Seacombe and Penelope Keith and all these people. They're really funny songs. And um, Could you do one for us? No, I couldn't, thanks. <laughs> you would if it were you, but no, I'm keeping this privately to myself. Um, but I love The Wind in the Willows, um, just the sort of the talking animal thing. I think I just, you know, um, overloaded on that a bit. There's a television show that we were actually discussing a second ago in our, in our exchange. It used to come on every um, school holidays and it was called Tales from the Riverbank. I don't know, Has anyone, anyone else seen that? Is, is it just me? Yay! Oh, yeah, At the end of the room. People, yep. 
Tales from the Riverbank went, went for 15 minutes. It was really short and it had um, the entire soundtrack was played on a xylophone. I'm guessing it was like not expensive to make. Uh, <laughs> they spent all of the um, budget on tiny, tiny sets and live hamsters because it was, it's a live action show, right? Well, no, it's, um, it's the adventures of these little friends that live on the riverbank, um, a rat, a hamster, and an innovative guinea pig called GP that's always um, inventing things, right? And you could just never make this show now because <laughs> the RSPCA would just not allow it. Um, they're, they're voiced by humans, but these real little creatures are just sort of, you know, um, you know, there's one episode where they're playing and they make a diving bell out of an actual hand bell, you know, and they go diving in the river. And so there's all these sort of shots of these guinea pigs having been sort of, you know, there's one where there's the guinea pig is operating a bandsaw and, you know. <laughs> it's and so Crab's explaining this to me in my office yesterday and then as she's describing it, I'm visualising like Beatrix Potter and Wind in the Willows and then mm. she pulls it up on YouTube and it's more like Twin Peaks, frankly. It's very weird. <laughs> And the thing that was... So Go and have a look at it. It's on, they're, they're, they're on YouTube. They're it, so weird. It was sort of oddly charming but also weird. And so in the episode she played me, the, there were two hamsters and they were making a clock tower. Yeah. They don't and go then, on picnics and stuff. Like, they do serious <laughs> shit, these guys. <laughs> and they're pretty proud of themselves when they're done and they're like, oh, I wonder what GP's going to think, who's guinea pig. And so then guinea pig, who looks massive... Well, yeah. I mean, you know... <laughs> <laughs> he, comes, he comes waddling over. Guinea pigs over. are bigger than hamsters. It's just one he of those things. waddling over. And he's, he's like, well it'd be fine if the clock actually worked. So he was, like, really not very impressed with the hamsters. He's a real literalist GP. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, it was such a strange little show. Yeah, <laughs> but great, heard. I think. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's um, I, I only realise how incredibly ancient I am when I look at it and realise that it was shot on Super 8 and, you know, <laughs> yeah. involved live animals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would not be able to make that today. Did you ever, I mean, what directed your reading when you were a kid? Like, did you um, read things that were a bit old for you or did you kind of like stick around with your age group or I started off sticking around in my age group so when I was in grade one I I had never gone to kindy or preschool or anything I just started <laughs> mixing with humans in grade one <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing before that just pestering your brother pestering my brother and my my nana um and I so subsequently because I hadn't really mixed with lots of other children I got <laughs> 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 you got sent home for biting someone what 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 I can hardly wait <laughs> <laughs> the, um, no, I caught everything, so I was sick all the time. So I missed heaps of tied scarlet fever and measles and, you know, consumption and all. Um, <laughs> no, not consumption, I made that up. Um, <laughs> anyway, so mum was worried about me getting disengaged and missing too much school, so she asked the teacher what should she do, and the teacher said, well, why don't you buy her some reading material? And she recommended some Enid Blyton, so the Magic Faraway Tree series and Secret Seven. And so I think that sort of probably... Secret Seven in particular created a lifelong love for plot-driven material because uh, I do like a nice r racy plot, much like Secret Seven was. Um, and so then I graduated to Famous Five, and then that was you know na that was the gateway into Nancy Drew and Trixie Belden and and uh, whatnot. But I did you know it's funny I was thinking about it. And I was thinking, did I actually read classics of children's literature as well, or was I just doing the children's well? I know you didn't read any Dickens. <laughs> True. Um, no, but I did. So I googled actually today 19th century and 20th century classics of mm. children's literature just to check if had I read any of those. And actually, I had read heaps. Um, so I loved The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Black Beauty, Little House on the Prairie was a major favourite, um, Anne of Green Gables. So I, I did read a lot of that stuff as well. But then I remember once I was a teenager, then I was reading. Um, Sweet Valley High and um, that type of stuff. That one, th those books where you could just pick up anyone and start reading it. And pretty much, that, yeah. They'd still be the pretty one and the, you know, smart one. Was it whatever. called Sweet Dreams? Was that like the romantic teenage... You're asking the wrong audience. They're like, no. I'm not sure. <laughs> I was reading Chekhov at that age. Like, I, like, <laughs> I don't recognise this experience. So it was the equivalent <laughs> of like teenage Mills and Boone, basically. And then that was the gateway drug into sneaking into the adult 
um, you know, uh. pot boilers. So grabbing off mum's shelf, the Danielle Steele, the Sydney Sheldon. Did everyone do Lace by bag. Shirley Conran? Oh, that was Lace was big among the grade 10 girls at Askley High. Um, <laughs> a bit of Sydney Sheldon. A bit of Flowers in the Attic was massive. Oh, yeah. Is that Virginia Andrews? Yes. Um, so, yeah, so I was reading all of that sort of stuff and then uh, – and mum and dad actually, mum more so, but um, because dad was away quite a bit with the army, but mum mum didn't really mind what I was reading as long as I was reading because I think her view yeah. was if you're reading, you'll find your own way basically and figure it out, which I think is true. Um, so I'm very non-judgmental about what people read. I think if you enjoy reading, just read whatever you like. Um, so, yeah, so that – and then once I got to university, then I sort of tended to – you just you, you ended up doing slightly more serious reading. Yeah. Did you go through a pot boiler space? No, not really. No, no, no I man, I just didn't. And no. no, well, part of it was because I have I have this really stern granny, right? She's about to turn a hundred. She's turning a hundred next month, and she kind of she was all into sort of you know trollop and stuff. Um, and she wasn't very tolerant of you know things that she thought were rubbish. And I think it kind of filtered down to my mum. And then, so, like, I reckon I would have had it, like, I wouldn't say I was one of those people who grew up in a house full of books or, you know, sort of thing. Like, you know, we had a normal amount of books around. But I th- always probably felt a bit embarrassed to have complete tripe, you know, right. on me. Um, so, I did a lot of, um, I did absolutely the Enid Blytons and all of that. Um, I went um, when I was probably about 11 into this kind of, phase of being absolutely fascinated by Agatha Christie and my auntie had a full like you know a kind of display set of Agatha Christie books you know that were the you know where where there were three novels in one bound beautifully bound volume (laughs) 20 volumes the complete works you know which I'm sure had been bought off some sort of you know late night tv show or something (laughs) and I went through all of those and I was you know every um every book of Agatha Christie's I was determined to spot the clue <laughs> and just never did because it turns out I'm just a really poor observer of people. Um, <laughs> so, and the other thing that I did that was really, really weird, and I know that my mum was concerned about it because at one point she raised it with my teacher. I, um, we used to go for entertainment because I grew up in a rural pocket um, to, uh, you know, country shows and things. There'd be like secondhand bookstalls, and I was obsessed with. Um, old copies of Reader's Digest. Oh, yeah. I loved Reader's Digest. Why was your mother concerned about that? Because she just went, ah, she doesn't read anything except Reader's Digest at the moment. (laughs) Is that weird? And, you know, the teacher just said, she likes to read, that's fine, you know. But I really, I had this plan that one day I would, um, I would submit, I'd make a submission to laughter is the best medicine and I would get the best entry and get 50 bucks. And I was just like, I spent that 50 bucks over and over again. <laughs> Never actually did it, but I was convinced that I was going to get the 50 bucks. I was fascinated by the concept of, do you remember the Penguin Club? Oh, no, the Puffin Club, sorry. Oh, the Puffin Club, the Puffin yeah. Club, yeah. yeah. Um, that was, I thought that was so great that you could belong to a club with other book readers. Did you ever join? Yeah, I did. Oh, did you? Yeah. Sent my, you know, I, I can't remember how he did it because I think he had to send it to London. Yeah, was, sounds yeah. right. So it sounds a bit like sea monkeys. They never worked out. <laughs> yeah. No, we, I did get something back from the Puffin Club, but yeah. <laughs> what about, did you watch any television? Well, apart from 15 minutes a day during school holidays of Tales from the Riverbank. Um, <laughs> well, because I was in the rural pocket, we didn't get a lot of stations. So we had the ABC and... Um, I, lots of stuff I wasn't allowed to watch. I wasn't allowed to watch Countdown or anything too sort of, you know, loose. (laughs) Uh, Although, oddly enough, anything made by the BBC was totally fine. So I could watch the two Ronnies. uh, I could watch the Dave Allen show. Because that was so much cleaner than I know, Countdown. exactly. Yeah. Just sort of like BBC filth is fine. <laughs> it's still good for it's the youngsters. It's still in a Porsche accent. It is. It's perfectly fine. I know. Fine. So funny. So, um, yeah, and um, I, I kind of liked the Kenny Everett show as well. <laughs> to watch that a bit. <laughs> I know, I'm just, I'm just giving it to you straight. <laughs> <laughs> I can't recall watching a huge amount of British stuff, although we did – my family was very fond of um, – some mothers do have them, and right. um, mind your language. Right. Okay. Uh, but I, I wasn't much of a one for the British shows, and I didn't. 
you know, that was the era where you'd meet people who were massive Doctor Who fans or massive monkey fans, which... Oh, I never got into Doctor Who just because I thought it was a bit scary and also just, I just wasn't interested. Mm. I don't know, I just sort of, I used to... I know, controversial. No, I just, <laughs> I've just switched it off if it came on. I mean, we only really had a short window of television um, uh, availability in a day, so you had to really ration it out pretty carefully. The I like the goodies. Oh, my God, I love the goodies. <laughs> Obsessed with the goodies. Um, but, you know, I, now I watch episodes of the goodies and I, I will never, ever find again that hysterical laughter that I just loved it so much I thought it was the funniest thing and um also the funny thing looking back on the goodies and um my partner Jeremy and I talk about this every now and again because we had the same perception when I watched the goodies when I was a kid I was convinced that Bill Oddie was the funniest one and now if I look back at it as an adult I realized that Graham Garden was the funny one but I just didn't quite spot that at the time Sometimes what kids find funny and what adults find funny, oh, you know, is yeah. different. Because uh, it's, well, it's, it's hitting you on a different level, you know yeah. what I mean? So, um, do you know, the show that is the lasting memory from my childhood is Days of Our Lives. Because <laughs> it was always on, my, so my nana lived with us and it was always on in the afternoon when I got home from school. So it was a sort of soundtrack, whatever the television equivalent is of a soundtrack in the background of my childhood and um that show's been running since i think the late 60s or early 70s and so that was before i was born and so i cannot remember a time where my family was not vaguely across the plot of days of our lives um and i can remember as a kid coming home and so i I would only catch the final 10 minutes of days of our lives when i got home but there was a certain era where there was a plot line that involved the salem strangler and um (laughs) And I remember I used to race home because they, they were trying to figure out who was the Salem Strangler and I would race home from school to see. I swear to God, they could stretch out a plot on that show for like six to eight weeks. It just would be... Yeah, you could be in a coma and then <sighs> come back and you'd be caught up again within... Just absolutely amazing. And even now, occasionally I'll go into makeup and it'll be on on the <laughs> television. <laughs> I love the way Crab's like, yeah, right. You go into makeup and it's on. Um, and... I will see some of the same people who were in it yeah. when I was a child and they're still in it and they don't look that different. Like, Imagine if that was your life. Dr Marlena Evans looks exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> She's That's had quite, quite the life, that woman. She's been kidnapped multiple times, <laughs> brainwashed. It's, yeah, so anyway, I sort of have a strange fondness for that show because it was just always there, basically. Did you ever read stuff that was kind of... Um, you weren't supposed to read or I mean obviously you were you filleted your mother's bookshelves yeah. of all Shirley Conran material yeah. which is and I remember um at primary school uh one of my friends uh light-fingered the thorn birds and uh we read all the sex scenes at the back of the bus and they were pretty low level but we were like oh <gasps> <laughs> it's very exciting. No, like other than the uh, racy pot boilers, I can't recall getting my hands on anything else. I remember going on a family holiday and staying at somebody else's house, and they had Lolita, and I grabbed that, and I wow, um, yeah. What age? I would have been about thirteen, I reckon. Oddly enough, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was really interesting because I, you know, I knew that it was kind of like a dirty book, as my strict granny would say she read by the way she read the whole of um um oh, famously impenetrable irish novelist james joyce ulysses um, ulysses sorry yeah. i just had a brain snap there she read the whole of ulysses she um went through the whole thing and then at the end of it i said what did you think of that granny thinking i can't believe you read ulysses she said mm, it's a dirty book <laughs> But I love that she's got the, the Protestant book ethic where I'm going to finish this dirty book. Clean. <laughs> so I love good. how her book evaluation is like, clean or <laughs> dirty? <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> like, but anyway, the funny thing was that I read, like I really speed read it, you know, because we were only staying in this place for one night and I'm going, like, I haven't got long to spend with this illicit material. And I didn't get it, like it, because it was so over my head. Yeah. And of course, like it's gone on to become just one of my all-time favourite novels. Like I could read that book 
again and again. If I was going to be stuck somewhere, that is a book that I would like to have with me because I can read it endless times. Same here. But, and, but my recollection of it is, and I really love it as well, is that um, it's not explicitly dirty. It's, it's more about longing and lust, isn't it? I yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's very little... There's nothing sort of Dennis Jensen-esque <laughs> about it. <laughs> How much fun yeah. was that? I'm sorry. Did anyone else really enjoy the Dennis Jensen book excerpts? I did. Anything the, that involves the phrase... She took him in her mouth. Oh, I think thanks. For it's just that. not a good. Oh. I know. Sorry. That's a dirty book. It is. A di- yeah. Um, Granny would know where to put that book. No, it wasn't so much. There wasn't much banned reading material, but I do remember sneaking in a few films that uh, we weren't allowed oh, yeah. to see. Which one was? Um, I went over to my friend's house and we watched a Nightmare on Elm Street when I was in grade eight, and oh, that was. I mean, I hate horror films and horror books and I should never have watched that because I basically couldn't... I don't know how many people here have seen it, but there's a scene... Every time, like, someone sits down to relax, like, in a nice bubble bath or lying down on their bed, they'll have their eyes shut and then out of the mattress will come, like, a hand with knives for fingers and then it's like... Um, so I'd be lying in bed at night just going... <laughs> Why do the people in those movies ever have baths? I mean, like, oh. I just think there are just things that you don't do. It's like the Amityville horror when they establish that the gateway to hell is in the basement and then they just keep going down there to double check. <laughs> just think, get out of that damn house, people. But, I mean, that's what happens in horror movies. People don't learn lessons. I um, went to a slumber party when I was probably about, I would say, maybe 10 and um, it was from uh, it was a slumber party thrown by my uh, good friend Juliet Jan Gregorio, and she had a brother called Romeo. They were Romeo and Juliet Jan oh. Gregorio, so great. And they um, and in the area I grew up, there was heaps and heaps of um, that's just creepy. Actually, about families. brother and sister. No, no, no. But it was just like they were fabulous and. Um, and um, their parents didn't speak any English. Like, I lived in an area that had heaps of um, first-generation first <laughs> migrants. And it was so funny. Like, the difference between their culture and my culture was um, so uh, profound that every time I went around there for a sleepover or a stay for dinner or whatever, um, they would, like... They were really animated and they would like yell at each other and I would just be convinced that I was witnessing a family breakdown every time. I'd be like, oh no, how's it gonna be when Juliet's family falls apart? And like turns out it's just like a normal conversation. But I was just like, oh god, the shouting, oh my god. But anyway, um they uh for the slumber party had rented um a uh, I assume beta video, as was very hip at the time, um, of the American Werewolf in London. Oh, yeah. And I just have never heard of the concept of a horror movie before or I just I was like, oh, well, there's people walking along in a, a, a dark moor at night. That was interesting. <gasps> oh, God! <laughs> and I promptly dived underneath Juliet's bed and I stayed there for the whole film. <laughs> and then I was just, I would say for the next two years, just absolutely haunted by yeah. nightmares, werewolf fear, you know, the yeah. whole, yeah, the whole I, deal. I think, yeah, same. I felt a bit yeah. the same about Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, it's not – those horror movie things, even today, like, I can't bear it. There was – um, what was that? It was a film I was watching with my husband not so long ago. What I, what I end up doing is I can't bear to watch it, but I also can't bear to not know what's happening. So I won't look and I'll be going, tell me what's happening, tell me what's happening. I want it, the action described to me, which he surprisingly finds yeah. very annoying. <laughs> Do you know, I really like the gentle subversion that we've brought to this session? Like we're at the Wheeler Centre, books, writing, ideas, terrible horror movies <laughs> um, and uh, schlock novels. Yeah. The, a TV show that I used to really love when I was young and actually... Uh, I love that you've just gently ignored <laughs> my suggestion that perhaps we should get back to books. She's like, <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> I said culture. Yes, OK. Childhood. All right. Um, the... Uh, so I think when you're a child of our vintage, you can't also separate your childhood from albums because, you know, my parents' album collection is yeah. quite, you know, um, I just remember I'd be flicking through their records and playing bits and pieces and whatnot. Um, and I remember we had a spoken word record, which was Bill Cosby, and it was um, <laughs> To Rustle My Brother With Whom I Slept. Did anyone else ever listen to that? Um, so That's it was a bit of an awkward title, isn't it? Yeah. Considering. Or was it Russell My Brother? No, it wasn't who I slept with, 
because that would be totally wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and we all know that Bill Cosby is not into that stuff in any way. <laughs> Nothing inappropriate. Um, anyway, it was about growing up in the Cosby family and they were quite poor. And I remember as a child I used to find it very, very funny and I loved the Cosby show. And so I do find all this Bill Cosby stuff just quite sad and deflating because it's like part of your childhood that you just feel like, oh, wow, what a downer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just on the um, back to the film thing as well. Um, I particularly loved <laughs> just because I feel like keeping us on a bit of a downer. Um, back to the Future was one of my favourite films, and so I just, I got just terribly sad whenever I see Michael J. Fox because I just loved him so much. It just makes me think how cruel life can be. Well, I think he's still having an okay life, isn't he? He is, but it's just it's just cruel <laughs> it's just cruel you want him to be able to skateboard everywhere still <laughs> well, even though he's to be like happy and not in pain oh, i know yeah oh. i um he was a particularly charming actor really wasn't he i used to watch family ties quite a bit and oh, right. yeah i um i uh he, he's really engaging charming i think visual. so and also some of those films like I just thought Back to the Future was a magical film. Like, I just – I loved it. I loved the idea of time travel. I Perfect loved books concept, about time yeah. travel as well when I was a child. Um, that, you know, or, or any sort of transporting book like, you know, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe I thought was great. One of my favourite, favourite books was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, I just – I always would be opening chocolate bars just thinking, is there going to be a gold <laughs> ticket in here? Um, and Made that's, up sales. <laughs> Made and up. I think also that's why I loved um, – the magic faraway tree too and all the different lands. I always used to yeah. look at the gum tree in our backyard longingly and think, I can see the top of that one. It's Fantastic Mr tree. Fox was, I think, probably my favourite dull novel for kids. Did you I, see the film? Yeah, that? I did. And did the you Wes like Anderson it? film. I loved it. Yeah, okay. yeah, I really liked it. Right. But yeah, that idea of the different little worlds that they'd burrow up into to find, you know, food and cider and whatever. It was so <laughs> relentlessly tricky and, and good. Um, you know, Malcolm Turnbull apparently is a big fan of Fantastic oh, you Mr. And Fox. You Malcolm Turnbull. I'm sorry, yeah, I know. Because she, we it haven't, just... this episode of When I Get a Minute hasn't aired yet, but there's one coming up. Oh, no, actually, it has it is, aired. It is, sorry, it has one aired. That's currently I've been out. teased about it for 24 hours She now. can't, because she's trying to, she's on deadline to finish this Malcolm Turnbull essay. You just have to go, oh, I like this glass of wine. And she'll be like, yes, Malcolm, Malcolm Turnbull, Turnbull likes wine. Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. Mm. You'll be like, oh, so I love that film, Back to the Future. She'll be like, yes, I'm wondering if what's going on with Malcolm is indicative of when he was back so as a lawyer tragic. with Terry Packer. It's, yeah. Even my children are a bit sick of Malcolm Turnbull. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. And Fair Cop, I, I think, as well. <laughs> um, what about, we talked about albums before. Did you have any favourite, um, like, what sort of music were you listening um, to? <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a record player and um, it... Uh, Mum and Dad uh, were quite cat reason, Stevens. I thought you were going to say we had a, a phonograph. <laughs> no, we didn't have a phonograph. Um, I got a cassette of um, Liberace's greatest hits for <laughs> for my birthday one year. I really, I really played that a lot. Wow. So yeah, I was yeah, I was that kid. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, mm. Mm. but I was really into it. The but Entertainer. The first um, cassette I ever had was Bucks Fizz, Bucks Fizz, mm. um, which, yeah, I was desperately begged for to get. And the first actual album I had was Summer Breaks 83. Um, right. But, yeah, I sort of – I did like mining Mum and Dad's album collection. I'm a massive Beatles fan. But I, Mum – I heard a song in a 7-Eleven or something yesterday. The song was Make It With You, which is, I think, by Bread. Is that right? And uh, it just – it put me so back into Mum's record collection because yeah. Bread, Carol King, Peter, Paul and Mary, that was all of her sort of stuff. A little bit folksy for my taste, but right. I can still hear some of that stuff and sort of think, hmm, don't mind me a bit of Bread. <laughs> my dad was a massive Marty Robbins fan, like country sort of stuff. And on driving holidays, if we, like we didn't go away all that much because we had a farm and – Farms don't like you to leave them. Um, but the Marty Robbins, it was just the one cassette as well, just go around and around uh, again. Yeah. Dad was a bit like that. Charlie Pride, Johnny Cash, yeah, yeah all that sort of yeah, It's all good of stuff, gear. but I do get a little bit, oh, I'm in a car <laughs> with my family when I hear it, yeah. Um, yeah, I had very mainstream music 
taste, except for the stuff I was learning on the organ, <laughs> which was a little. Well, it was mainstream. Was that when for you organ. were a wedding singer, or before? That was before because I was young. I didn't do that till I was at university. Was this when you were a Highland Imagine dancer? if you were like a thirteen-year-old wedding singer. <laughs> I'm sure it's happened um, and you would be the lady to do it, to well be honest. that is true. Um, no, the Highland dancing, I still like the sound of the bagpipes actually, which I think is, I like the drone sound with it. Can we go back to books for a second? Yes. Um, <laughs> so, what I, I want to know, you know like when you're a kid, you read books because people tell you you should read books and because these are popular children's books and like there is a bit of way that's laid out for you when you're a kid like this is a book that's appropriate for a little kid and everybody likes this book and so on I mean there are the smash hit children's authors and you know now it's everybody every kid reads Harry Potter and stuff like that but when was the first time you remember working out what you liked in a kind of literary way like when you read something because I remember reading just I just read all the time and I would just read anything really Mm. and it was ages before I think I started to work out the difference between what was great writing and what was just writing. And do you think there was a particular book that triggered that? Yeah, I reckon it was when I I started reading Frank Morehouse's um, novels and they just really reminded me um, of my country town and the people in it. Like it was a real kind of bridge to kind of Australian writing and I went and sort of sought out everything that he'd ever written and kind of um, consumed it. And, and there would have been, like, I would have been probably 17, 18. It was not, you know, um, when I was super young or anything. Yeah, I can't, um, I can't recall a particular book, but I know that somehow in the process that happened. That's why I think it's fine to read whatever you like mm. because I do think if you keep reading, you will just come to good literature eventually because you... you I mean, I guess it's like anything. I think your taste just evolves. And so then, you know, stuff that seemed okay now just doesn't seem good, you know. So... um, I remember going through books that I was completely... Like, I read everything that Kurt Vonnegut ever wrote and I thought I was incredibly sort of, you know... God, I'm sophisticated. Yeah, I I never had a a sci-fi phase myself. But again, I I think sci-fi is a maligned genre because it's like... um, People think it's like romance and that it's just all trash. But no, there is some really, yeah. really good sci-fi out there. It just doesn't happen to be my bag. It, I'm past sci-fi, but I did go through a big phase of it. Um, right. And I decided I was going to write a sci-fi short story and win a prize. It was very interested <laughs> in winning the prize. It was just up for the cash prize. Never uh, entered one competition, of course. But um, We're going to take some questions from the floor in a minute, so think if you have anything that you want to ask. But two quick questions. Did you ever read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? I did. Did I you did. like it? I, I, I thought it was fine. I didn't kind of... Um, I had some friends who were completely kind of could just make jokes back and forth for yeah, hours it was one about, of those books, you know, blah, it? Yeah. blah, blah. And I, it didn't really hit me in that way, not yeah, at all. Yeah, I, I loved it, but I was – and I read all of the Douglas Adams stuff, but I wasn't um, like one of those obsessive types yeah. about it. And um, did you like Little Women? Loved it, And yeah. did you have a preference for which of the female <laughs> characters you liked? Is there anyone apart from Joe that you well, would ever be? Clearly not, no, but no. I just wanted to check because yeah. sometimes you oh, surprise yeah. me with your... I wanted your... to be Beth. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I wanted to be the pale one whose who's translucent fingers uh, the tears <laughs> fell through. <laughs> or Amy, know. the upper self one. Well, no, I, you, no, I just never know with you. You could have said <laughs> mommy or something. So, you know, I just, just, just wanted to check. Um, all right. Um, shall we take some questions? Sure. <laughs> When I was, like, younger, right, my mum would always, like, force me, kind of, like, she'd steer me towards, like, things she used to like. So when I was a kid, I was watching, like, HR Puff and stuff. It's the only kid that did. Um, <laughs> is there anything that you've sort of gone, oh, hey, kids, let's watch this, because I really enjoyed it? I you made my children there. all watch everything I could find on YouTube of um, Tales from the Riverbank <laughs> just this morning. <laughs> just this morning. Did they like it? They loved it. But you've also got a good story about getting Audrey to read something that you really loved too early. Oh, um, well, I got her to try and... My nine-year-old is obviously my guinea pig of reading. Um, And uh, I tried to get her to read Little Women because she's quite an advanced reader, but it was just like, it was, yep, she wasn't going there. One thing that actually I had a massive success with recently was 
we all drove somewhere that took hours to get to and I downloaded um, a, an audio book of the Swiss Family Robinson because um, my mum read that whole thing to us and I was absolutely transfixed. Like, it's, it's the most ridiculous high camp kind of story really is this family that gets um, shipwrecked on a desert island and they just magically turn out to be good at everything. Like, and they're a Swiss family. Franz, I have made uh, a tree house. Here, come, see. <laughs> and they're, they're going, oh, look, there are so many fish in this pond and I have made a hook and they are jumping onto my hook. Um, and they've, they've salvaged just enough stuff from the shipwreck to really just make a completely productive life. You know, like, oh, there's barrels of you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's totally ridiculous, but the kids really got into it. And that was, a, I felt that was a real win because I have very, very affectionate um, memories of that book. And, and the recording is actually just incredibly old and kind of <laughs> scratchy and terrible, but they really liked it. So the, that was quite cool, I thought. I'm wary of trying to get them to read stuff just because I remember mum, see, mum will be loving you in this podcast when she listens That's to it. That's because I'm a mum charmer. You are a mum charmer. Do you know Malcolm Turnbull was called a mum charmer once? <laughs> He was. He was. Uh, <laughs> By <Mum>, Steve Kilby. <laughs> Mum used to try to get me to read lots of animal books, uh, like Gerald Durrell, who I know you also really... Obsessed with Gerald Durrell. I've read every single thing oh, that he's s- ever... Stop your mum, I need to charming. spend more time with your mum. <laughs> <laughs> so Gerald Durrell, though, what a writer. Like, seriously, I... I just consumed everything that he wrote. And he wrote, again, <laughs> about vaguely, vaguely disguised sort of animal abuses. He sort of travel around the world. This is where my mum's listening and she's going, oh, I had the wrong daughter. The, yeah. Um, and you so did, pretty much you did. Mum, <laughs> pretty much if mum suggested something, I would, no, 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 I don't want to read that. So I am wary of suggesting stuff, but I would really, really like it if my boys liked any of the Anne of Green Gables series. <laughs> And I would really, really like it if they liked The Neverending Story. Oh, yeah, That's yeah, a okay. beautiful book. Um, so I will be wary about suggesting those things and I'll be just hoping that they sort of come to it by themselves. I'll be like leaving it lying around in strategic positions without actually yeah. mentioning it. I love how I've seen you trying to be subtle before, <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, let me know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, yes. <clears throat> Hello, I'm fangirling so much right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, when did that become a verb? I like it. But you're like <laughs> did you read The Babysitter's Club? And if you did, who did you want to be? I think I was too old for The Babysitter's Club. It came as best, I can't recall it, as a youngster. I don't even know what you're talking about. That's how old oh. I am. That's terrible, A little isn't bit it? low brow for Annabelle. No. <laughs> that was... Or perhaps um, they were dirty books. They, they might have been dirty <laughs> books. They might have been a dirty book. <laughs> Another question. <laughs> um, Did you ever, like, I mean, I know that you cycled around on your bike pretending to be, you know, Nancy, Nancy Drew. Drew slash Trixie Belden, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to remember if I ever fancied myself. Did you ever role play a, anyone in literature? <laughs> um, I, don't think, I don't think I ever sort of thought of myself as being any of the Little Women characters or anything like that. Um, I think I felt a bit drawn to some of the Russian heroines. <laughs> oh God. I did go through an incredibly Anyone pretentious in phase. Or? I think I, w- I did go through a very pretentious phase when I was in about maybe year 10 or 11 where I was sort of like f- wafting Moping around, around the like place. Anna like, uh, yeah, still, yeah, Standing a little bit. at train tracks, yeah. just looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you have a happy childhood, you're always looking for opportunities to, those, to, to, to be Some glum. of those farmers in the neighbourhood be going, love, I saw that strange crab girl at yeah. the train station again. <laughs> I did used to kind of, like, carry books around with me and look like a weirdo, yeah. <laughs> Particularly when we were doing farm chores. <laughs> oh, questions, questions, <laughs> questions. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I'd like to know, if you were to write a musical together, what would it be about? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, what would it be about? I think it would be about... I think we should write a musical about attempting to devise a television show. You know what, I'm just so grateful you didn't say, I think we should write Malcolm, the musical. (laughs) (laughs) That was what I first thought. 
You know that um, he did write a musical when he was like, oh I'm not God. even joking. He wrote a musical when he was at university called Lang is Right and he wrote it with um, Bob Ellis. I know, yeah. And hi, hi, Malcolm. It's me. <laughs> yeah, I'm well, thanks. How about you? Look, I, I just, I, I think you need to take out an AVO. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Oh, he knows. Okay, good. <laughs> He did, though. He wrote a musical at university, so there. <laughs> he also won the Banjo Patterson Poetry Prize with a, poet, a poem called A Woman is Just a Woman, But a Good Cigar is a Smoke. <laughs> well, that's a song title right there. Yeah. So, another question, thank you. Oh, she's really cutting me off at the Hello. Knees. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about what you've been baking lately. What, where, what, sorry? What we've been baking lately. I baked this morning something that I was meaning to bake for you but ended up staying up writing and crying too late so didn't actually get around to it for when I last saw you. And um, I, the, just plain banana muffins. I make a kind of like banana yogurt muffin which is a good, you know, kind of kids' lunchbox thing. But I had... Remember when we went on that... Um, when I get a minute episode to that market and mm -hmm. I was walking, talking, crying, talking about <laughs> Mar Malcolm Turnbull the whole time and I bought that bunch of rhubarb. Yes. Well, I, often happens to me with rhubarb, I think, oh, rhubarb, there's so many great things I can make with rhubarb and then it sits there awkwardly in the fridge occupying too much space and getting limper and limper <laughs> and limper. And so I ended up, I stewed it like with a little bit of sugar um, and some um, green apples and like a bunch of rhubarb, two green apples, and then about a cup of frozen raspberries that you put in at the last minute. Oh, it really does good things for Yum. that compote. Anyway, so I've been sort of doling that out to my kids. And this morning when I made the muffins, I put a little like, like quite a decent spoonful of rhubarb compote on top and then some crumble. So they became a sort of a banana rhubarb crumble muffin. Mm, that that was good. Yeah, it was good. So I made this week in a forthcoming episode oh no. of When I Get a Minute, <laughs> I'm just so happy to be able to tell you about this, um, a bunt cake. Why, what's, what are you laughing about? Okay, just say bunt cake about 20 times really fast <laughs> and then when the inevitable happens, <laughs> you will have said what Lee said on camera while we were filming this thing and like every now and again on that program... And it's, it, it's fine on the podcast because you can do, you know, 10 minutes of out-of-control laughter with sort of snot bubbles and everything. It's totally <laughs> fine. But when, you, when, when it's a filmed thing, then there's like an anxious makeup person just going, you bastards. I know. And now the crew, I haven't talked to you about this, but now the crew knows when we start, they can tell the signs of us losing it. And so <laughs> when we started losing it at the upstairs the other day, within about three seconds I heard Stamatia, the director, say, Makeup <laughs> with that sort of tone. And also I've noticed that you and I get into that really wound up state of hysterics and nobody else is laughing. No. They're like, they're, they're smiling politely, but we're the only ones who are in that complete... Just like vomiting with laughter and like oh, rolling just around. And then we can't look at each other. It's, it's just, just really, really hard. It's really stupid. So I made this bunt cake. It's, a, it's out of simply... So far <laughs> she's really pulling it off, it's isn't she? It's out of this cakes. They're very hot right now. I don't know why. What the where does these things come from? Where does the bun cake come from all of a sudden? <laughs> You're just trying to entice me to say... I am. B ...bunt cake yes. a few more times. Um, it was a pumpkin spice bunt cake and it turned <laughs> out <laughs> really nicely. It was a very smug bunt. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then I made actually my kids' dinner and crab's dinner as well, um, which was a penne pasta with pesto and grated zucchini and then on top is eggplant that you've already cooked and mozzarella cheese and a bit of parmesan and cherry tomatoes and then you bake Delicious. it a little bit. And I didn't even forget you're a vegetarian. I know. For once. You're good like that. Mm. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I'm question. about to go away. Like once I've totally handed in this book on Monday. <laughs> is it going to be ready for Monday? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a real, I'm a real, uh, I, I would say that I'm a stickler for deadlines except that it was actually due in like February and I just <laughs> said I can't, I can't do it. Um, but I really, I'm a real kind of journo about deadlines, like they, 
I, I don't break them. Also, because the longer you leave it, the more you extend the pain. And yep. also, I'm going away um, with my family for a couple of days um, to a beach house that's got a really good kitchen um, with a bunch of other people. And I've got my whole cooking um, sort of... It's going to be a light display of show-off baking because right. there's going to be other people there. Just um, a light display. One thing that I'm going to make, and really, um, I had this and ate it and loved it before I knew it was a Yotam Otolenghi recipe, but it is. Um, I had it in a cafe in Tasmania, and it's fresh polenta. Now, polenta, I'm always a bit underwhelmed by it, frankly. I'm just like, well, if I wanted some glug, I'd, you know, (laughs) I don't know. I'm I'm just not a, a massive fan, but the fresh polenta, it's just chalk and cheese with the, uh, with the dried stuff. So... What you do to make a fresh polenta is that you shave with a sharp knife, you know, all the kernels off about maybe about six ears of corn and then you um, put them in a, um, a saucepan, cover them with water and cook them. I think maybe with a little bit of something or other, I can't remember what. Um, maybe some, maybe a little bit of onion. No, I think maybe it's just the corn. Anyway, so you cook it till it's soft and then you bzzz, um, blend it. And then... Roll it into a log? No, you don't. <laughs> pat it. Pat, pat it. it. Pat sorry. it into a log. Pat no, you don't pat it into a log. Sorry, yes. Then you put it into a fry pan with some... Um, with a, you know, a pleasing amount of butter. And then you just cook it, stirring, as you would with normal polenta, except you're going from the other direction. And the consequence is that instead of getting sort of not entirely tasty sludge, you get intensely sweet, delicious sludge which you then um, you crumble feta into and then you can um, you, you make a little sort of eggplant pickle on the side. And what I did, which is what this cafe in Tasmania that I visited did, I'm aware that I'm going on about this now, so I'm <laughs> going to wrap it up, um, is you put the um, fresh polenta into a baking dish, crack eggs into it, and then you do a bit of butter dotting, if you must, and then you bake that in an oven so you get baked eggs in fresh polenta it is just outrageously good so i'm going to be doing a bit of that another question yep you seem to have got to the point of being able to be in a position enviable one where you seem to be able to address partners needs children's needs and be creative at the same time don't know about addressing let's patch those guys in (laughs) Because yeah. mine is just like cooking dinner going, where is she? No, I oh. Think, yeah. oh, you're I in Melbourne. I think if either know. of them bothered listening to this, they would probably, oh. as you said that, go... <laughs> <laughs> well, well all hot gone. tips oh, will be, you know, really appreciated. About oh, how to... tips. Oh. oh. <laughs> is, there a, is there a tip uh, that... I don't know. I just feel like I'm just barely <laughs> managing. Yeah. That's that's yeah. it, right? <laughs> you just you just, just wake up and all you just the time go, crying. I've just got to get through today. Well, like, that's I mean, there is a significant amount of joy, right? And I just every day feel um, fortunate that I have a job where I can kind of juggle things and shift things around because that's not true of everybody's job. And um, I can kind of go back to work after the kids are in bed. And I just figure that in this phase of my life. I get up early, I go to bed late, I don't ever shower alone. Like, that's just my... (laughs) (laughs) You know, you reach that point in your life where in the old days you'd be thrilled to be going to a hotel room with someone and now I'm just thrilled to be going to a hotel without anyone. Oh, (laughs) completely. Oh, (laughs) baby. (laughs) Look at that empty bed. (laughs) <laughs> I know, that's all right. Yeah, so g- hot. <laughs> Guy Pierce could knock on my hotel room in his you bathrobe and, and I'd just be like, oh, God. <laughs> Go away. I love how all of your sort of ironic sexual fantasies always involve Guy Pierce. <laughs> Why do you say ironic? I know. <laughs> just like whenever you're like, you've you got the inverted commas going like, let's say some, I don't know, Guy Pierce. Guy Pierce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Uh, question, question, yes. Hi, um, from the podcast, I'm aware um, Lee's a bit ruthless about throwing away the books. So what's the sort of both of you, the criteria for keeping books or the throwing away? And (laughs) do you still keep the books that Annabelle gave you for the Christmas? (laughs) (laughs) We talked about actually the books Annabelle gave me for Christmas, which I thought was so hilarious, that lengthy inscription in that one. Um, I wrote an inscription because of her... 
just subhuman <laughs> obsession with throwing <laughs> things away. I wrote, I, I got one of my own books, not even one of the better ones, and, um, and, and, and wrote a lengthy inscription saying, you know, this was given to Lee Sales by Annabelle Crabbe on this date. Lee's home address is this. <laughs> Her mobile number is this. Her personal email address is this. So do <laughs> if, feel free to get if you in find touch this, straight away. <laughs> if you find this in a second-hand bookstore, please drop it around to her personally. Um, uh, they are on my bookshelf just because I'm not sure how to deal with that th- thorny problem. Um, no, I actually, we talked at one point about just sort of blocking out the actual personal details, maybe leaving my email or something, and then just releasing it into the wild and seeing if somebody would find it and bring it back. I think that would be really fun. We'll do that at some point. We'll just sort of seed the area with some yeah. books and see, see where they see end up. See what comes back. Um, I don't ever... Th- I, like I, I find it really hard to throw books away and I've got way too many and because I just... I think I've got, a, I've got kind of a short attention span but I remember like just about everything that I read and one of the like incredibly great pleasures of writing for me is to think about remember some passage that I read years ago and go and find it and kind of relive it and then if it's instructed something that I'm writing then I just find that so satisfying and just being able to grab that book and then you know what happens when you open up a book that you remember what was happening in your life when you first read and loved that book. You know, I love that. And to have the actual thing there and to see the coffee cup ring on it or, you know, or even what my handwriting was like when I wrote my name in it, I find so affecting. And for many years um, when I moved house a lot, you know, as you do when you're a student and whatever, as I collected books, I kept them in the same order and they were roughly in the order that I'd acquired them in. You know, so... Every time I moved, I'd pack them into ca- to boxes sort of in order and then I'd unpack them in order. And then so my filing system was really nothing to do with subject area or title or author or anything like that. It was when did I get this book and when did I first read it? And so um, I had um, a few years ago a very well-meaning friend um, uh, reorganise my books while house-sitting <laughs> and into sort of book size and so it was, um, I got, oh, thanks, Racing. oh, Lord. Um, and so having worked from a system where I could visualise where, you know, in the order of things, a book came. Um, and in fairness, that system would have just gone dramatically arse up in the last few years when, when I get sent more books and, you know. So I've, n- I've now gone into sort of subject areas, so I've got kind of, fiction, um, then I've got American politics, British politics, Australian politics, and, um, you know, it's sort of country-based more than anything else. See, I've recently moved house, so I've given this quite some thought. Um, the, for me, it's, um, is it of sentimental value? And oh, for like, me, that's a no, fairly high bar. No, is the answer. <laughs> I was like, it's just like, do you know what? I got this fantastic phone call from Lee's husband, <laughs> Phil, um, Brendan, as we know him commonly uh, on the podcast, where he rang me one day and I think I wasn't at my house and he said, have you got a copy of uh, Detainee 002, which is Lee's book? Um, she's only written one. Mm. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, two. <laughs> um, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've got, got it at home here. I said, why? And he said, oh, I, just, I actually need it for, you know, for his study that he was doing. <laughs> and I said, well... Mm. You live with the author, man. Like, <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I think Lee chucked our copy out. <laughs> you threw out I your didn't. copy of your own book. No, I didn't. He just couldn't find it. Um, the, oh, so, so that was, to me, that was like really hardcore. I just thought, <laughs> wow. So it's got to have sentimental value and that doesn't include like a Christmas gift from a fairly recent friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking like my mother's childhood copy of Black Beauty is like that hits the sentimental bar. Yeah. Um, Although you've kept the book that you wrote as a child, I think. <laughs> Flora's Fancy. Hey, that's a classic. Got no problem. Um, it's got to be something that I think I will read again or refer to and it has to be something that I think is not 
sort of cheap and very easy to get. Um, so, like, I was thinking the other day, do I need a personal copy of Anna Karenina, even though I really like Anna Karenina? I kept it because I thought I will read it again, but you can probably get it on Amazon for about $2, probably free, actually. So, yeah, that's... <laughs> I feel like I just lost the room. <laughs> It was like that moment at the Sydney Writers Festival oh, last year where you cold. said, I'll never read any Dickens. And like half the room's just gone. You literally heard the ripple of yeah. disquiet. They were go just like, the you could hear the sort of like the chick of Ooh. cigarette lighters as they lit their torches, you know, to come for you. Yeah, it was pretty. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I have read a Christmas Carol, actually. I have read some. Dickens. Oh, well, there you yeah. well done, love. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take um, a few more questions before we run out of time. I don't. I don't. I feel I am a bit awkward with finding books electronically. Like I do. I love electronic books. I like being able to carry around a reader where that's got you know a bunch of books on it. But I always like to have the hard copy as well, which is really oh. tricky. Also, the other thing that you can't ever throw out is books that people have signed to you, like where the author oh, has yeah, signed I could it. Oh yeah, care less. Like I've got to still like the book. Like it doesn't matter if they've signed so it. So you'd be happy to throw out sort of. Um, Lee, uh, you were such a big part of the writing of this book, Salmon. Like you just. <laughs> well, sorry, <laughs> I don't. I didn't even like the Moors last time. <laughs> I don't like Salman Rushdie that much, right, so I probably wouldn't get a signed copy of his book. But uh, no, that's you wouldn't want. You're it. not going to trick me into keeping stuff just by signing it. <laughs> <laughs> Had crossed my um, mind. The oh, I forget what I was going to say. Next question. Um, how and when did you first meet? So you cold called me. Yeah, um, I did. Because she, we knew lots of people in common, um, but yeah. you'd been living overseas, I'd been living overseas, we'd never met, and you were offered a job at the ABC. And so you rang me and said, we've never met, but, you know, we all know the same people. So, you know, it's a matter of time. I've been offered this job at the ABC. What do you reckon? Is and it a good said, place to work? You said, yeah, do it. And then I came to work at the ABC. I was massively pregnant and... Um, you said, oh, come over for a cup of tea. Oh, yeah, that's right. To your house with Which the, went for with about the eight very hours. red <laughs> population. And I really, yeah. like, I popped over and I looked, horrifyingly enough, it was a work day, actually, and I was doing, um, I was just, you know, plugging away at general work and I had to do a radio interview at 4.30. And I went round to your house at 10 um, to say hello and have a cup of tea. I think you made a cake or something. And it, we, we really had not had a proper conversation before. No. And so we were just, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And it was the... Str I've never experienced something quite as weird as this, but I swear my phone rang and I thought, oh, just... Um, all right, I'll just get this. And it was the producer of the radio show saying where are you isn't that weird it was like six hours i was and of I course going when is this going <laughs> god it's been six hours like, oh i'm so i can't believe i'm talking about this stuff Lee. i just never <laughs> felt this way before like, but it was really weird and do you know what like when you meet somebody and now just shut your ears because you'll get a horror horrid big head but you know sometimes you just have a great conversations with people and um, and the time disappears and you never run out of things to talk about. And, like, you know, we now for the last year have been doing a podcast where we just talk shit, you know. Um, and I just – I don't think we just ever run out of things um, to discuss, weirdly the, enough. And I think also, the interestingly, when we started doing the podcast, I thought this is a podcast about mostly books and, um, you know, movies or film or television whatever but actually from the way people have reacted to it I've come to realize it's a podcast about friendship and people say to me often the most common feedback we get and I find it so just flattering makes me so happy people say they feel like we are their friends um which I just think is so great um so yeah I really love that but I also think sometimes with my very good female girlfriends it's that thing about um like the fact that when we do the television show that you and I will be in fits of laughter over something and no one else really finds it that funny but we find it so, so, so funny. And ordinarily that's a really successful model for a television show <laughs> where only the two people involved find it in any way entertaining. 
<laughs> um, should we take it's two? It's gonna run and run. <laughs> Let's take two more quick questions and then we'll we better go. Um, to spaghetti tree. <laughs> um, anyone else? Bueller, Bueller, down the front here. Are you checking your phone? I, it's just been buzzing oh a lot. God. Is it might be something Malcolm? about Malcolm? Oh my it God. Is. Yes. Um, yep. I think what always am amazes me about you guys is the fact that you're dealing with all of these in your other professional lives. Um, I would think these sometimes awful people, politicians. Yeah. <laughs> And yet, you seem to have this sort of alternative persona that you're just nice, normal people. Does it ever get you down the other side? You know, not well. She is a monster. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't get down. Uh, so, look, sometimes I get frustrated with the political interviews and stuff. I get more down by just the um, just sadness of what's on my show every day and. Um, which is why, you know, I really enjoy the podcast and books and, and that sort of stuff because, you know, some days I just think I just can't have one more day of listening to some poor child who was sexually abused or some poor person that lost their house in a fire or, you know, something. Um, so, yeah, I, I like being able to be... Cause, because my day job is very serious and I take it seriously, then I like to be just silly and fun in my own life and also I think you know we sort of have this tendency for people in public life to straight jacket them into oh well you you know you are a serious host of a serious current affairs show so therefore you know I must always be serious and I must be in my downtime watching documentaries about Syria um, <laughs> but no because people are more rounded one would hope than that and so I like being able to do a bit of um, you know just fun but don't stuff. you think i mean the brain is an unusual organ and and the the way into reflection is just there there are so many paths mm. in i think and um what i always admire about you is that you um you're an incredibly broad consumer of content of any kind like i mean i don't know how you get through as much stuff as you do um you you do more so than me i think um but your way of connecting things up is really, um, I think, impressive. And I think if you if you do do a program like yours, you have to be active on all sorts of levels. I think, um, and um, I think that light is as useful as shade sometimes mm. in making keeping your brain supple, which is sort of what the Ridic job's about. Ridicule is a much underutilised weapon too, I think, in um, political critique, which you do really well, uh, which is sometimes pointing out the ridiculousness of somebody like sticking to their talking points or something like that, you know? Like ridicule can be a very powerful tool, I think. Um, okay, one more question and then, uh, then it'll be time. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering whether you had any books that you associate with life transition phases. That's an interesting oh. question. <laughs> I think um, Joe Chinque's Consolation by Helen Garner and I was reading around the same time. I was living in the US when that came out. Um, that and um, I sort of went down this rabbit hole of reading... Um, narrative journalism like In Cold Blood by Truman Capote and The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe and various books like that. And it made me think about journalism differently and just the power of narrative in journalism. And it made me... Helen Garner's writing always makes me think about the power of sparse writing and just yeah. choosing the right active words to convey something. And I actually use that even when I'm crafting questions for 7.30 because it's still a form of writing. And I think a really sharp and tightly written question is heaps more powerful than a waffly, verbose one. And so I just remember that actually the whole time I was in the US, I felt like I learned so much about journalism. Uh, um, but particularly that period of reading that, I think it was called the new journalism, that stuff um, I found really impacted my thinking on what journalism could be. Helen Garner has just instructed so much of my thinking on lots of stuff, mm. really. She's a ridiculously um, accomplished writer. And I'm reading her new book at the moment, but I'm, every time I write another thousand words, <laughs> I, re I reward myself with one little 
chapter from her <laughs> new book. It's just working out really well, actually. <laughs> I love how yesterday Crab had a writing day and so she sent me like, often our exchanges are like quick brief text messages, but no, 9.15 like three or four paragraph email musing about a few things. I responded with like two sentences thinking, mm, I can see what she's doing here. Another, th- another reply, three or four paragraph email. And so I replied, no, 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 no. I can see what you're doing here. You're not writing three paragraph emails. You're doing your book today. And then she said, I have, I've just banged out a thousand words. I'm just having a quick shower. And then I was like, no, we are doing this Alejandro Inarutu style. No showers. <laughs> We're immersing. We're going to be filthy by the end of this thing. When I I'm going to come around to your house and have a shower. A bear is going to be giving you a touch-up. <laughs> <laughs> That's, again, something that only we find funny. <laughs> no, I'll tell you the story behind that, which I think I can, right? Can't I? Yeah. yeah. So we were doing this, um, we were recording an episode of When I Get a Minute and we were, oh, God, it's so bad. We were <laughs> just getting into a state of hysteria about arguing about who should have won the best picture Oscar and me saying I really liked Spotlight I thought it was a great film but I didn't understand why it won the best picture Oscar and if you were like George Miller you'd be like well well like you know I was in an inhospitable um, filming landscape for you know about a year <laughs> you guys shot in the in the building of the Boston Globe that seems unfair and you've chimed in yeah, what about what about Leonardo? He'll be like, I got raped by a bear. <laughs> and then we just went into this whole thing about the bear being falsely accused and, and how, crab was and crab, how crab, crab crab was like, you know it wasn't a real bear, right? <laughs> and, anyway, and we, we were in into, that full kind of we got shrieking, full hysteric, screaming, snot bubbling kind of it was just I don't know. No one else it was, was finding funny. it no funny. funny. <laughs> and and then eventually we kind of kind of pick ourselves up off the floor and get kind of <laughs> swabbed by the makeup um (laughs) (laughs) it didn't make the cut it didn't because the director just said i'm not having the two of you sitting around making bear rape jokes on (laughs) on international women's day like (laughs) yeah no no fair enough fair enough yeah the other bit in that episode that didn't make the cut which i also found hilarious was um we would somehow got down a rabbit hole of talking about Oh, that's right, because we were disagreeing about George Clooney and I said, I just, I personally don't find George Clooney that attractive. And so we got, it didn't make the edit, but we were saying, well, who do you find attractive? And I said, well, Guy Pearce, obviously. <laughs> and so I said to Crab, what about you? And she said, oh, I like those sort of intelligent, weedy types like, you know, John Cusack. And I said, oh, I just, I wish that you had said, um, The Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's hot. Um, anyway, then that we just broke up in hysterics about Crab with the Rock. It didn't make the edit. It's really only just stopped. Really. Why didn't? Why did that not make the edit? It was. Funny. I don't know. Just because it was know. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, never mind. I would have said Jimmy Stewart if I'd thought about it more. Okay, one more question. Now that she's eating that thing, quick, oh, talk good. to her while her mouth's full, and then we'll get out of here. Oh, because we're running over time. Sorry. I oh, know we've really probably no one's the clock. got questions now. It's going to be like this awkward ending, like oh, that's it. No, I see a hand right down the back. Um, Lee, this is pretty specific for something that you were just talking about. Mm-hmm. I was wondering if uh, we could get our hands on the radio um, documentary you did about Savannah and John Barron's novel. Oh wow, that actually I've been meaning to hunt that up for my own producer who just read Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil for her. Um, her book club. So when I was in Washington, I went to Savannah to do a 20-minute radio documentary about what had happened to Savannah after the writing of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Um, and it was just, it was one of those assignments where you just think, firstly, this makes up for all the times I've had to sleep overnight in Guantanamo Bay and Hurricane <laughs> Katrina and stuff. But um, I just kept thinking, oh, I cannot believe I have pulled this, that I'm in Savannah <laughs> doing a documentary about Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And I'm going up to New York to interview John Bell. Um, yeah, okay, I'll see if I can find... I've got it. I know I have it on a CD. And then this bear around. appeared. And then a bear <laughs> showed up. Um, I have got it somewhere at home. So if I find it, I'll ask my producer if she can post it somewhere. So just, yeah, we'll mention it in the podcast or something if I, if I can track it down. That was an incredibly specific question. It was. Are you okay. dissatisfied with that as a final no, question? No, I just think maybe we'll round off with something more general. What are you reading next? Uh, I just started today or last night 
<coughs> Elizabeth Strout's new book, My Name is Lucy Barton. Um, I loved Olive Kittredge. I love the Burgess boys. I just think she's fantastic. Um, and, oh, God, it is just so good. Like, pound for pound, her writing is just... She's one of those people... And the television version of Olive Kittredge, I thought, did this so well too, where a single sparse line just flattens me. So there was one, um, it's in the context, of course, but the line that I read last night that I was just like, oh, it was, um, mum, was it scary getting a taxi? And it was just, the context of it just makes it a killer line, even though it's just very, very basic. And I just admire that sort of writing so much that packs such a epic emotional punch. So, yeah, that's what I'm reading at the moment. What about you? Well, I'm drip feeding myself oh, some Helen Garner, quality yeah. Ghana, yeah. which um, is just the best way through any kind of oppressive situation. I find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, we love our chat and listeners, and we have missed you guys while we've been um, doing our when I get a minute. Which, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, what's the value of seeing us as opposed to just hearing us? I don't really know. I mean, it's a lot um, more effort for us. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, imagine how less... good the audio is going to be on this thing. I know. It's going to be spectacular. <laughs> We're going to come to Melbourne and just do it this way every time, um, which would hardly be inconvenient at all. No. Um, I don't know. I think um, the other thing about the, pro- the TV version is that it's edited. See, when we do mm. the podcast, we just, pre- we just hit record, go for about 35 minutes... 40 if it's incredibly <laughs> hilarious or interesting. And then we just stop it. Even if we've got more stuff to talk about, just because yeah. figure that, you know, who needs really more than half an hour? Yeah. Um, and then and you just get the whole thing. Like, there's no editing mm. um, ever, really. Um, no. So, yeah, the world of editing is... is um, it's important if you're putting together a 15-minute television program that also has to look nice mm. um which ours always does thanks to our excellent team but i have to say the lo-fi thrill of the ill-disciplined <laughs> blather for half an hour i uh, i love it i gotta say it's pretty appealing yeah and we're glad it appeals to you too so thank you very much <laughs> thank you <laughs> visit realcenter.com for the best in books writing and ideas from melbourne australia and the world <laughs>